Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, June 27th, 2024. Good as always to have you on board, everybody. It is I-Day or Induction Day for the new plebes here at the U.S. Naval Academy. Class of 2028, welcome aboard. In today's episode, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Okay, let's get to my guest today. Joining me from Newport, Rhode Island is retired Navy Captain Sam Tangretti. Sam's been on the show before. He's been writing books and proceedings articles for the Naval Institute for decades. He's won or placed in many of our essay contests, and he's the Lidos Chair of Future Warfare Studies at the Naval War College. Sam, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. All right. I also need to mention that Sam is the co-author of a book that we published in March this year called Algorithms of Armageddon, The Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Future Wars. So, Sam, uh, AI seems to be in just about every discussion these days. I, I listen to Bloomberg and NPR when I'm driving to and from work. A lot of talk about NVIDIA, the maker of the most advanced AI chips, recently becoming the most valuable company on the planet in terms of market capitalization. So let's start by talking a little bit about some of the military applications of AI. What's, what's emerging uh, among those military applications that you think are most important? Well, Bill, before I ever begin uh, with a panelist or at a, a conference I do, I always ask, first thing, give your definition of what AI is. And there are three definitions. And if the importance of definition is the way you see it is how you're going to see what the future is, both military and civilian applications. The first one is machines that are able to replicate human behavior. And that's what everybody's afraid of. Uh, as far as AI controlling humans, that sort of thing. Uh, the second is what is more realistic is statistical tools that teach computers to make decisions on past data. And that comes from a uh, vice president Oracle. And finally, the third coming from a Navy commander is anything we haven't done with computers before. So depending on what your definition is, is how you see it. Now, as far as military applications, there are three, um, there are a whole number of applications, but the first one is decision-making. The decision-making tool, it crunches big data, it gives you some, some uh, information that is an aid to decision-making. It doesn't do anything per se, except give you, bring that information together. The other and the important one I see in the future is driving autonomous systems, autonomous weapon systems, autonomous uh, ISR system. And then there's also human machine teaming to actually control weapons and that. And then finally, there's, there are other aspects, and that's kind of the back office businesses that uh, DOD does, um, managing the supply chain, that sort of thing. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask is uh, about the perception that there is an AI arms race. Um, and, you know, China and Russia, their military applications, that they're racing ahead to apply AI to military uh, operations. Uh, so is there an arms race going on? And, and what are China and Russia doing with AI? Oh, there's definitely an arms race going on. The problem is we have not recognized it. Back in 2017, Vladimir Putin gave a speech in which he said, you know, artificial intelligence is the future. Whoever controls this sphere will rule the world. Those are his exact words. So um, both China and Russia see this as a military tool. And we haven't. We've looked at it as a commercial tool and with military applications. But um, they're way ahead of us as far as uh, using AI and military applications in Syria. Russia tried to use it with. Uh, main battle tanks uh, to have them operate autonomously. Uh, and uh, it wasn't a success, but it's what they're working towards. China is doing, doing that sort of thing too. Uh, we don't seem to recognize it, but 
China and Russia have great advantage over us, China in particular, because despite the fact that we believe they're running capitalist businesses, every business in China has to provide the algorithms they use to the People's Republic, or to the Chinese Communist Party. They have an inventory of all these. They're particularly concerned about any sort of AI system that allows uh, dissidents to communicate and share information, that sort of thing. But no, they 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 under control. Every company has to give that to the government in the US. That's we don't do that. So we have no control over over commercial AI. Got it. It's private IP in this country, but uh the, the Chinese uh, have access to all of it, no matter whose IP it is uh within within their borders. Got it. Um so uh Sam, the title of your book, Algorithms for Armageddon, reminds me, and I'm dating myself a bit here, the 1983 movie War Games, which featured an advanced computer that controlled U.S. nuclear response options. And thanks to the efforts of a young hacker, played by Matthew Broderick, who was like 17 at the time, that computer thought the U.S. was under attack and it almost launched a nuclear counterattack. So could that scenario be plausible today or in the near future? Or, or maybe if it's not, you know, nuclear Armageddon, um, something along the lines of, you know, computer systems, AI systems, controlling uh, firing decisions on lethal weapons? Well, first, the uh, we would only give control over nuclear weapons to AI if we're incredibly stupid, because inevitably there will be an accident of some sort. That's inevitable. AI, like all other complex systems, have what we call normal accidents. They're so complex, they're so tightly tied together that each each piece has to operate properly. There might be a glitch in the code. There could be hackers, whatever. So there's going to be those sorts of accidents. So given that control of nuclear weapons, I mean, that's a, that's a big mistake. Um, we call algorithms of Armageddon for a different reason. Our concern is not about AI controlling humans. It's about humans using AI to control other humans. Uh -huh. And particularly in the decision-making mode, if you remember in the Cold War, the Soviets had what they called correlation of forces, which was this grand calculation of all the big data. It didn't have AI, so use computer, the computers of the day, humans, to now analyze whether they could defeat NATO in a war. What at the current moment in time? My fear is that AI will be used by Chinese Communist Party and other to determine when is the optimum time to involve, uh, invade Taiwan or whatever, because all the big data says this is the moment. This is when the, the greatest probability of victory is given how the U.S.'s policies are right now, which is part of the calculation, what their military strength is, what's, what kind of weapons Taiwan, crunching this big data, gives them, you know, here's the output. And then if the general secretary wants to make his mark in history by uniting all of China, he's going to use that big data crunched by AI to do that. Now, people say, well, humans wouldn't do that. But that's exactly what Imperial Japan did in the start of World War II. If you, if you go through the records and you read about the just it's not a transcript that was um, kept diary by the uh, one of the the ministers minister of foreign affairs when you read it you see at the decisive meeting of the japanese cabinet deciding finally to launch the war they asked the intelligence officers how how much more powerful is the united states than japan and the answer was seven to eight times which was absolutely true because in the war we produced seven times the ships, the whatever. But they said in the next year, they will be 10 times given their, their shipbuilding program. Next year, they will be 11 times. So the Japanese decided this is the time based on the calculations. You know, we can't achieve victory. Even We may not achieve victory, but we can't. So now with AI, you could gather all that data, put together in a central location and make you know, statistical tools to make predictions based on past mm -hmm. data. If the human being, the decision maker, accepts that and decides to start the war, that's where Armageddon could start. Got it. Got it. So humans using AI to make decisions 
that uh, impact uh, other humans and society and, and uh, the, the global economy as a, as a whole. Um, so from, from your perspective, Sam, um, and also uh, I'll, I'll mention that George Galderisi is the co-author on this book with you. We had George on the uh, on the show a couple months ago, talking about military writing and, and uh, learning to be a good writer. Um, but uh, George and you have teamed up for this book and um, a great a great team it is. Um, but as you and George looked at this, what did you see as the greatest risk of the US military integrating AI into its weapons and its command and control? Well, the risks, AI like any computer, I mean, in essence, is very sophisticated computer program that trains the computers in a different way that we have. So it's always um, open to hacking. I mean, nothing is secure. Anything that has software in it is not secure. But the most important thing that I see is that if we apply commercial AI, which everybody's talking about commercial off the self AI, or the commercial companies are going to save our defense or whatever, <clears throat> commercial companies can't handle deception. It's not part of their business model. Google does not know how to not be deceived except by gathering more big data. And in a, in a war, you're going to have less data as the war goes on, as your sensors are treated. I, I, I've talked to a CEO of a major AI producing firm and said, look, um, you know, how do you handle deception? And I said, you will always find the pattern in the anomaly within the pattern of information and to avoid being deceived, all you need is more data. And I said, mm. in war, you're not gonna have more data, you know? So basically uh, they don't know how to handle. It. Now, IARPA, which is the intelligence DARPA, uh, Intelligence yep. Advanced Research Problem, are dealing with this problem. I, I've talked to them, they said we were aware of it. I, I wrote a major proceedings article, in fact, prize winner about that deception and they read it and contacted me and said uh, uh, let's talk a bit about what you see and they're working on it it's higher classification level than i need to know but they're sure. working on that but so deception I is the primary problem got it i remember uh, that article from it was a couple of years ago uh and a, an example stood out at me and we, where you said that uh as a, uh, you just use the example of as a as an Amazon customer, and Amazon uses a lot of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that's how it figures out, you know, or, or what you like to buy, and it offers you things that you're probably going to buy, um, or have a good chance of of purchasing. And you said that if uh, if in your uh, a few days before going on Amazon, if you were visiting lots of sites that had to do with playing tennis. Um, you know, the U S open or, you know, started shopping for a, a tennis racket or something that Amazon would start to serve you up uh, options for tennis rackets or options for buying, you know, Slazenger tennis balls or Wilson tennis balls, despite the fact that you're not a tennis player, right. Mm -hmm. um, that, that you could, you could trick it, right. You could trick it. And that's your point. I think that makes a, that, that example stood out for me about your, your, your point about deception, that mm -hmm. if the adversary, in, in this case, you know, most people aren't going to spend time going and looking at, at, at uh, products online that they're not interested in. So the data all comes through a variety of different sources and Amazon can collect that. And then Amazon can say, oh, you know, you're, you're looking for a tool chest or you're looking for a new lawnmower or you're looking for a new, you know, women's sweater. Um, but with uh, with an adversary, if the adversary starts serving you up information that that can lead to that deception, then yeah, that's you got a you got a good point there. Um, mm -hmm. I want to flip the question now. So the other side of that question: so what are the risks that the U.S. military lags its adversaries in AI? So what if if China and Russia get ahead of us in in how they want to use it? What are the what are the risks if we um, are not moving fast enough with artificial intelligence? Well, I don't know about necessarily moving fast enough, but in this case, there is a great asymmetry in what they're willing to do with autonomous systems. Autonomous systems will be driven by artificial intelligence. Yeah. US has a firm policy that says we will not allow a drone or a UAV or UV of any sort to use lethal force if there's not a human being making that exact decisions, push the button. 
you know, that's, you know, reapers flying over the terrorists. It detects, it doesn't fire. There's a person, there's a pilot there in a windowless room in an air base near Las Vegas who actually does that. Right. The problem is in a major war in which you are facing a technological near peer, I mean, you talk about China, you talk about Russia, that sort of thing. You're not going to have communications with that system. The first thing they're going to do is try to jam everything. And my belief is as the war goes on, you're going to have less and less communication. So you need to have these systems programmed in a way so within the parameters, they are able to use lethal force. And what we want with the current policy, and it's been this way since Obama administration and, and, and continues, current policy is that we're not going to do that. But um, and that's because we want to keep humans in the loop, as it's called. Our yeah. argument is in the future, humans can't stay in the loop in, a, in a, a, a war like that. We'll have humans on the loop. That is, we will program and, and direct the system what to do. We send it out. It conducts that mission. Maybe it's successful, maybe it's not. We won't actually know from it because it may never return, but maybe we get battle damage assessment from something else. But it's very much going to be like U.S. submarines in World War II coming out of Australia, you know, operating. The Admiral Australia never knew what they were actually doing moment by moment. They were given a patrol sector. They were given a mission. They did it. If they came back, then the Admiral would know. Maybe an uh, aircraft flying over could report back if they you know, damage, you know, if they, you know, enemy ship is on fire or something, but that's what's going to happen to UVs. And we're very reluctant to do that. China and Russia are not reluctant to do that. Uh, they're willing, willing to give it the authority. Now we kind of have a false notion of that because we already have weapons that do that, you know, human humans on the loop, not in the loop. For example, the old captor mine now called hammerhead, you know, it's in place. It has this um, this uh, library of all possible targets, all possible ships, down to the fact that this is the, you know, uh, SS whatever, and it can select which target it wants to fire at. You don't push a button; it selects, but you programmed it for the mission. That's what we're going to have to do with UVs, and we're not, we're not there yet. We're not willing to think in those terms yet, and that's why we're going to lag them got it i i guess you could in, in, to if you took that analogy a little farther you could say that a tomahawk you know standoff 1500 nautical mile missile right is uh you're, you're you're making the decision to send it on a lethal mission um but you don't make a decision at the final moment when it when it attacks its target you're making that decision a half hour or an hour or to, you know, beforehand, right? So well, you're, you you got to trust that once you hit send, that it's going to do what it's going to do, that would, what you wanted it to do, I guess, is the point. But your point is that the Russians and the Chinese are much more willing to use artificial intelligence to let the machine make lethal decisions. Yes. Now, the, the, the nuance with the Tomahawk is that you, you directed it to a target, you know, and, and the you know, captor hammerhead uh, doesn't know when the target's going to arrive or or it's it's there's a, a, a difference there. But there's a lot of things that we use in the Navy that constitute under the definitions artificial intelligence. But because they're old, we don't refer to that. Uh, CWIS, close in weapon system in the completely automatic mode qualifies for being artificial intelligence because it's replicating human behavior. It's, you know, detecting, tracking, and then deciding when to fire and yeah. um but it's old like um the commander said uh you know it's whatever we're doing with computers now that well, we haven't done before so we don't consider it in that terms and uh the big mistake is that people think this is intelligence this is high level computing we're using high level computings in a different way in order to allow systems to operate and as I said, make predictions on past data, and you may give it the capabilities of taking some action based on that decision. Yeah. So, Sam, um, I wanted to to make a a, a subtle um, point. I, I mentioned that you are the the Lidos Chair of Future Warfare Studies up at Newport. You're not a Lidos employee. You're a you're on the the 
the pay the you're a U.S. Navy employee, Naval War College professor, right? Um, but in that job, though, your your job is to look at the future of warfare. Your job is to be a futurist, to think about how is warfare going to change in the next 5, 10, 15 years. I got to participate in one of your, uh, it was like sort of a, a pseudo war game slash workshop a couple of years ago up there at Newport. Really interesting. Um, what kinds of questions are you and that your your organization getting from the Pentagon? What what kinds of things is OpNav or perhaps a larger Department of the Navy asking the the uh, Department of Future Warfare Studies at the Naval War College to contemplate? Yeah, um, just let me start talk about Lidos for a second. Lidos gave the Naval War College Foundation a big grant for research, so they get Got to it. name the chair. You know, Got there's a ex, you know, there's a Ruger Chair of International yep. Economics. There's so that's that's my connection. Uh, I like them, but we we're not connected. Anyway, um, Pentagon has so many sources of information. I wish they would rely more on the Naval War College's Center for Naval Warfare Studies. I mean, we we give them information but uh, there's so many so many competing people with ideas that they don't necessarily come to us my job is to look at the future 50 years out and say what does the navy need to ask you know tell the leadership you should be asking me this because this is this is what's going to be the big issue so um some of the thing and and the big thing in future warfare studies there's a lot of people studying emerging technologies i'm a strategist who looks at technologies and asks the hard questions you know uh, how do we integrate it in our strategy you know will it really cost this much what are the vulnerabilities that sort of thing so uh, tying strategy to this emerging technologies are the big is the big challenge for the future because someone mm -hmm. will have this device to do whatever uh, a uv that can you know and they'll say well it solves all your problems but figuring out how to deploy it maintain it integrate it with a strategy those are the tough the toughest questions of all other people are doing um you know what the new technologies are i'm looking at them and saying how we integrate in our strategy and i think that's what the navy needs more from me and from the Naval War College than uh, just talking about, okay, we're gonna have uh, nanotechnologies and this is what it does. Well, you could get that information elsewhere. The question is, what's it gonna do for the Navy? What's it gonna do for the Department of Defense in a war fighting scenario? And yeah. that's what we have to look at. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna um, sort of back out a little bit and go up to maybe the 30,000 or, or higher level here and not just think about AI for a minute, but also think about broader perspectives and issues. And I'm, I'm recalling your general prize essay contest winner this year, uh, which was about the replicator project. So a lot of, lot of uh, news about the Department of Defense's focus on this thing called the replicator project, which is, hey, we can, um, using lessons that have been learned or seen in uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, if the Department of Defense just, uh, you know, can can uh, produce thousands, maybe tens of thousands of small unmanned systems uh, like the switchblade and other weapon systems um, that that we could um, we could deter war with China. We could deter the ability of China to do, to um, uh, invade Taiwan or to, uh, you know, do what it wants to do with the South China Sea and other things. Uh, your article said build weapons, not, you know, not small, not cheap drones, right? Um, and some of those cheap drones and some of the not so cheap drones are, are, you know, are powered by artificial intelligence, or as you said, very high computing capabilities. Um, what, how, how do we find the balance? I guess my question is this, right? So we're seeing the Navy having a real problem building ships. Uh, the Constellation class frigate program being now three years behind, the Columbia class uh, SSBN looking like it's going to be delayed. I can't imagine that it won't be. Uh, you see the Ford class that took multiple years longer than it should have to to build. Um, there's you know the LCS classes uh, both had s severe problems with them. 
So the Navy's having a hard time putting more players on the field, as the CNO likes to say, in terms of ships, in terms of putting ships and submarines at sea. Um, are unmanned systems going to help solve that problem? Are we going to be able to build unmanned systems faster and fast enough that it will make up for the, the lack of ships that the Navy has? And if those systems are powered by AI and can operate on their own and operate and make the autonomous decisions, is that the focus that the Navy should have and perhaps not worry about shipbuilding? Where, where do you see the balance between these sort of new systems that are doing so well in the war in Ukraine, this unmanned, small, cheap um, weapon systems and, and ISR systems versus, you know, the very capital intensive aircraft carriers, SSNs, SSBNs, frigates and destroyers? Well, um, Ukraine has basically come down to a trench war. And the distances between combatants is relatively short. If you look at the greatest success that um, the Ukrainians had against Russian tanks using uh, UVs, you see that the average range of the attack was seven miles. Now, in a conflict with China, the range of engagement will be thousands of miles. Those small UVs can't, can't, they have no role in that sort of war. They have no role in the Western Pacific, except you could, you, Taiwan could use them on the beach, you know, you could use all the little UVs against the incoming amphibious sh ships. But by the time that's happening, the war is already gone, gone south for them, because that means that China's already got a, a, a good force, mostly across the strait. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what we can do with it in that. I, I, I hope someday we don't have to defend the beach at Waikiki using them. But if DOD wants to produce these systems and say we're producing it to help the Ukrainians or we'll give them to Taiwan so it can defend the beaches. Well, that's one thing. It's not going to deter China. China's got missiles that outrange ours. We haven't bought, we have not built a new, completely new missile design in 40 years. They've got DF-21, DF-26. We have no answer to that. We don't have enough ordnance for our ships now. So why are we spending the money, even if it's not a lot of money, to build these drones that have no role in what we consider the number one threat. Um, it makes no sense to me except for a statement, we're doing something about China. It's the wrong thing to do because it has no effect. These small drones can't travel a thousand miles you know, from, you know, from Guam into the theater. We're gonna have to get them in the theater on a ship, you know, and then deploy it that way. Yeah. So. Well, that's one of the reasons that, you know, we're, we we need numbers. Now, people expect UVs, like unmanned surface vehicles, to be able to do in the near term things they cannot do. Such it's, as? One thing, it's one thing to have a, a USV that can follow along other ships. The great success was navigating from San Diego to Honolulu. Well, you could do that various ways. But for a ship to operate in combat where the enemy is shooting at you, where the enemy trying to destroy you, you uh, AI can't handle that now. Uh, it, it can't. It can't do multiple tasking like that. We are mm -hmm. so far away. Just think about self-driving. You know, I mean, dis despite Elon Musk and this, I'll have 10,000 robo taxis on the street by one was it 2019. Um, recently, the CEO of Rivian said, you know, we really won't have self-driving cars, real self-driving cars to about 2050. So uh, technology takes a long time. We don't, we're nowhere in the situation where we could replace ships with those except for specialized missions, which we already do using some platform. I mean, sail drone is great for, you know, information in the region. Same thing we always used to do with helicopters. Okay, but they're, they're getting more expensive and, and, and may not be even cheaper or, and they're certainly more, not more flexible. I'm not, you know, singling out that one company or that one system, but those are not ships. There's a great statement by Nevin Carr, retired Navy uh, Admiral, who was the um, uh, chief of naval research, and then right. he um, he was also head of Navy International Programs. That's where I, I work with him, and he worked for Lidos and those sorts of things. He said, you know. 
we don't think of Sea Hunter really as a ship. We think of it as a satellite that floats. Ah. Because it's an information, it's an ISR information platform. Nobody pretends that it's going to attack an enemy ship using a weapon. We're nowhere near that. We're not going to be near that for at least 25 years, more maybe. Mm. So at this point, if you think China is going to do something in the near term, then you, you need to build ships. You need to b get ordnance. You know, the, no, UVs are not going to replace fully because just like AI, here's AI, the great success was the AI that can beat the chess master or beat the Igo master. Well, that's that's true. But if you went to that system with a checkerboard and put that down, system can't recognize that. It doesn't know mm -hmm. how to play that name game. It, these systems cannot multitask. And a ship in battle or ship threat by the enemy has to multitask. I mean, the decisions are in the various different uh, environments, various different domains. You have weapons coming in different different directions. AI cannot handle that at the stage that's in. It Not may yet. never be able to truly handle that until, you know, long after we might be on this earth. <laughs> All right. Well, Sam, um, I'm going to give you a, a, a last chance here with uh, what what do you see, you know, if, if you were able to talk directly to uh, Secretary of Defense about implementing AI in, in, uh, in the Department of Defense, what would you think the most important thing to focus on would be? Well, first I would say, don't be over if, uh, over optimistic on what these technologies could do. And I, okay. I have two words, two words for being over optimistic, and that's rail gun. Uh, you know that the Navy predicted that would be the number one weapon system is supposedly had an initial operating uh, capability, would have it while we were on active duty. Uh, right. Technology takes a long time. Recently, uh, DepSec Def, who's who is a brilliant person and a great leader was out in Silicon Valley and they were showing her um, autonomous vehicles. And she said, I didn't realize, this is a quote, I did not recognize that it would take us this long to achieve autonomy in these vehicles. And the thing I would say to her or to leadership is it's going to take much longer than you think. It's going to cost a lot more money than you think. And guess what? It's not going to come from commercial uh, sources from purely civilian sources, they will have to partner with defense industry in order to come up with products. So expectations are too high on what this mm -hmm. could do. This is a tool in the toolkit. AI is a tool in the toolkit. That's what it is. It's not a solution. It's a tool. And as long as we view it that way and integrate it in our other capabilities, that's kind of the message that I would give. Um, you know, the various technologies, we're going to eventually we'll use them. We'll use hypersonics and that sort of thing. But many of the those sciences, many of the technologies are not ready yet. And to expect them to be ready tomorrow just because we can increase computing power is a mistake. All right. Well, that's a good way to wrap it up. Um, so this has been a fascinating conversation, as all my conversations with Sam Tangretti are. Sam is the co-author of Algorithms of Armageddon. The Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Future Wars, available from the Naval Institute Press, in published in 2024. Sam, thanks for your time today. Uh, great, great job with the book. Congrats to you and to George, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. All right, this episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is, every, is important to everything we do. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org slash join. That's a wrap for today's show. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.